Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University, and welcome to something special, remarkable. Welcome to the grand final of Flinders University Three Minute Thesis. That was a disappointment, but what you're about to see is not going to be a disappointment. It's going to be absolutely amazing. But before I tell you what you're about to see, let me present something really important, and that is an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present, and any Indigenous colleagues with us today and watching out there. Hello, you are spectacular. So what are we going to be watching today? Well, the nature of COVID is that we were unable to present a live event, the live event of the eight remarkable finalists for the three minute thesis. Now I know this seems remarkable. What is the three minute thesis? Well, our incredible PhD students compress all their research from an entire PhD, 100,000 words into, you've guessed it, three minutes. Not three minutes, five, three minutes. Yeah, boom. Mm -hmm. So you've got the finalists. Here are the people that have gone through the semis, gone through everything. These are the eight finalists. And that's great. So you're going to see that in the next little bit in this short film that I've made. But you're going to see something else too, because we made a decision through COVID that we would do judging a little bit differently because we could source judges from around the world. That's the nature of asynchronous digitization. So we have, we've sourced four incredibly inspirational scholars, thinkers, humans on the planet that are joining us today to be our judges. So you're going to meet them shortly. You're going to meet them. I'm going to have a bit of a chat with them. So you'll see these four remarkable humans. Then you're going to see the eight videos, the eight videos of our finalists, which is tremendous. And then we'll return once more to the judges to get their generic feedback on what's occurred and how they feel about the proceedings. And then we finish with the announcement of the winners. So we're going to give a People's Choice Award because democracy matters. The People's Choice Award, we're going to give the runner-up award. And yes, we're going to announce the winner. So if you want to pause this video, go get yourself a cup of coffee or something stronger and sit with us and enjoy this experience. Flinders University Finals, three minute thesis. Let's introduce the judges. Hello, I'm so excited. Uma, Dr. Uma Umangay, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, Uma. Well, thank you. Good day to you. It's nice to see you. Oh, it's been, it's been so long, it's been too long. And mm -hmm. Umar, I'm so thrilled and I'm so appreciative that you've taken the time to judge our three-minute theses. You're an expert in so many things. You're an expert in teacher education. You're particularly an expert in STEM education and enabling STEM education for our Indigenous colleagues. And you are certainly an expert in decolonising the doctorate. So I did want to talk to you about, in some ways, decolonisation, whether we're decolonising first year, the entire curriculum, our universities. What is the role, do you think, of understanding, let's say, Indigenous epistemologies and how those mm -hmm. Indigenous epistemologies can transform an entire university. Tell us a little bit about knowledge and how it moves and how it's transforming within your experience, say particularly in Canada, Uma. Mm -hmm. Right, so one of the things that I've experienced um, at the uni that I'm working with right now is there is, um, how can I say, a methodology or a terminology called indigenizing um, programs or curriculum or pedagogy. And based on my experience, I think as researchers, we have to understand that decolonization and indigenizing the academy are different things. Yes, yes, yes. Um, for me, what I see is that indigenizing the academy, you have goals, you have um, look for us, you have assessments, you have policy changes or even policy mandates. So for example, um, welcoming 
uh, welcoming statement to Indigenous communities, um, kind of borrowed from our Australian and New Zealand brothers and sisters out there. So it's being mandated now. Um, instructors have to know about the Indigenous communities where we work with. Um, and if possible, and this is where right now there's a lot of tension with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, where people cannot see quite the role of putting Indigenous knowledge. So I think that's where we need to, um, some of us as researchers, to push back and help understand that there's a lot of technology and understanding. It may not be in English, it may not be in formatted journal articles, but there are, you know, <laughs> dances, songs, languages, storytelling, pictographs that can, um, um, knowledge is about star systems and um, all those sort of things that need to be shaken up in the academy. And right now, there is still a big debate amongst us in Ontario, whether that should be a mandated thing or a voluntary um, approach from researchers and instructors in the academy. So that's ongoing right now. And then the other part that I, I'm struggling with, and, and this is the work that I'm also kind of doing on the side, is the decolonization aspect. Yes. So one of the things that it's very difficult is with decolonization, it's all going to be different for all of us. Yes. So some of us work with um, um, moments of privilege. We may be white or non-white. So we, we approach and attack colonization in different facets. So one of the things that we're trying to push or, need, or me to have a dialogue with is the idea of the self, really critical self-reflection, where again, it's where you, you have to self-reflect, but there has to be action involved into it. I mean, this is where, you know, I listen to these brilliant people in these three minute theses is where, you know, it's all these knowledges, but you know what? It's not just expounding great knowledge. It's actually them doing something for community, for society, for something for the global world. And I think, I think that's the part of decolonization is that as researchers, we've got to step back and say, well, you know, I can write beautiful words. I can say beautiful um, speeches, but it's the actions to transform the community or make the community part of you that is part of decolonization. So I, it is almost like a two-pronged thing where you are indigenizing academy, but you're also decolonizing yourself through conversations with others. If so. anybody had, had any doubts or questions about why I asked you to be a judge, I think <laughs> you just dispelled it the last two minutes. I'm so excited. Look, can you and I promise you and I might do a vlog in the next month or so. Oh, to, lovely. To talk yes. through that. I, I would love that. Uma, the only final question I'll ask you before we see these wonderful three minute theses in this film is, are you, are you optimistic? about uh, STEM education, particularly in building those relationships with Indigenous communities and particularly Indigenous knowledges? Are you, because that, that's the space you're working in right now, yeah. are you optimistic about that future or are you worried? I'm, if you asked me about maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would have said very optimistic, but I am worried now. Um, oh. I think, um, when I work with communities, and right now we're doing math and robotics and, and some science experiments with young people and high school kids, it's um, how to get them engaged. It, one of the things I've come to observe and have great conversations with is young people, young indigenous brilliant minds want to do science if the family loves science. And it's not an isolated incident where Schools are not the, the solution. Schools are part of it, but the community, the parents being engaged. So it's almost like challenging the way we actually do science schooling where um, the kids are there, but also, you know, why, why don't you invite the elders and the parents back into the fold? And um, so what we find is we're getting a very good cohort of young indigenous science kids and students going into our program in engineering. Um, but it's for me, it's not good enough. It's still a minuscule amount. And, um, and the way politics and even the academy is we, we entice Indigenous students, rightly so, to go into law, to social fields, to nursing. 
Um, some go into medicine, but there is also the greater work with, um, and I, I can't think of a better word right now, but the terminology we use is the hard sciences, you know, the physics, the chemistry, um, the calculus, um, where in one sense you're working by yourself and trying to make sense of the universe with complex languages and, and mathematics. Yes. And it's it's another, but it's it's like almost speak another language. So, you know, they had their own language, their own communities, their own ways of being and epistemologies and conceptual frameworks. It's how do we engage the indigenous mind to be part of that hard science, the, the physics, the chemistry, yes. you know, the, right? And um, at this moment right now, we're just working a, a small group of young people going through from, you know, kindergarten and kind of working with them as they proceed to um, high school level. And hopefully whatever unit age, university they choose, that's fine. But hopefully they will go into the science field. Um, it is um, right now I'm worried because it still seems like the structures involved or the way we talk is not inviting. So we indigenize, for example, science and engineering. We talk about Aboriginal architecture. But how can I say it is still a put, um, it is indigenous knowledges and scientific language and terminology just overlaid yes. on it. If we can only change Creative the center, age. right? Yeah. So um, if we could center that, um, for example, if we had um, indigenous students from the James Bay area, um, Hudson Bay, where instead of yeah, the terminology is important, but if you learn science, what are you going to do for the community, right? And that's the goal. That is the, the motivation, right? Memorize all these things. Spend three hours every day at a lab, you know, four hours studying. But you, it's for yourself, but you're doing it for the community. You can, you know, build water treatment plants. You can inspire young people to go into the science field. You can challenge, you know, the diamond mining, the oil, oil mining. And, you know, work with the Indigenous lawyers and see how you can gain control and sovereignty over certain aspects of the economy. Um, so it's, it's, how can I say, right now, that worry is that we're still colonizing Indigenous science students. Yes. And um, we need to bring a lot more Indigenous <laughs> science instructors or instructors who are allies who can who can decolonize and work on that um, scientific and STEM programming. Right, so Uma, I could keep speaking with you about <laughs> this. And can I say the other thing I'm obsessed with is exploring early childhood education and science and indigenizing uh, early childhood curriculum particularly. So I tell you what, we're gonna come back here and you and I, we're gonna, we're gonna riff for some time. But I tell you what, from that incredible introduction, you can see why I asked you to be a judge. Wow, you are changing the world, Uma. And look, are you happy now? Let's, let's have a look at all the videos. Right. And then, then I'll talk to you again if I can as the judge and we'll find out what you thought about them, okay? Okay. Okay. Well, in my opinion, it's incredibly important for doctoral research to be disseminated because it's the most current research and it will impact decision-making. But aside from that, I think you need to think about your own research process and how you benefited from open access content. You're also making this research available to independent scholars. And as I, as I mentioned to policymakers, those in government who are making decisions that impact our lives. So it's really important to think about disseminating your doctoral research online as soon as possible. There's so many other advantages as well. So apart from the ethical issues of making this research openly available, you may want to think about this. If you put your research online and it's freely available, it'll have greater visibility. It'll be discoverable by Google Scholar and on other subject-specific portals. 
and you will be providing scholars in your area with the service by promoting and flagging your research so that they're aware of it and they don't waste time duplicating this research. Remember what it was like when you started the doctorate. It also means that by making that research freely available, you will get cited quicker. And there've been various studies to prove this. Also, if you're lucky, a publisher may find your thesis online and offer to publish it as a book. You may get an invitation from an eminent scholar to publish a chapter in an edited book or an editor of a journal asking you to publish an article. These are all the reasons why you want to make your thesis openly available. I think the other thing you need to think about is extracting the data from the thesis and uploading it once it's been anonymized into a data research repository for the same reasons, so that other researchers can reuse this data and save time and money. You will also get citations for that. But I think the key thing is that by putting your research online, disseminating this research online, future employers, potential co-authors, and your network can have evidence of the quality of your research. So I very, very much hope that you will think about disseminating your research online. Good luck. Steve, I am so thrilled to see you. It has been, is it a decade? Is it a decade? Um, it probably is a decade since we were here together uh, in Brighton. Yes, it would be, I would say, a decade. So I've been here, I've been here, believe it or not, I've been here in Brighton now for 14 years, which is a big shock. But uh, yeah, so it's been a, it's been a pretty much that long since we, we, we actually conversed and worked together on something. So yes. Uh, well, can I say, unbelievable, and, you know, long live the North, and wherever you travel, the North follows you, sir, so I'm thrilled. But what a, what a time, and again, you're heavily marking at this point and marking wonderful dissertations, and I've asked you, and you so graciously agreed during what in many ways is your holiday, to be a judge for the Flinders University three-minute thesis. Now, the three-minute thesis exists a bit in the United States, but not as big as it is in Australia and just moving into Aotearoa, New Zealand. But Steve, I have asked you to look at these eight videos. And the first question I want to ask you just to sort of talk about you and how much you bring to this judging experience. Obviously you are, you know, obviously dead famous, but you're dead famous through a whole series of different industries. And, you know, we often forget, you know, when we're dealing with say the cabs originally, the incredible work that you did between sound and vision. I often think that the vision component of the cabs and the visuality of your career is often underplayed. And I think that's a huge mistake. So Steve, what advice would you offer to, as you can see, these remarkable higher degree students that are drawn from a diversity of industries, how would you advise them to continue to develop the relationships between all these different industries and ways of expressing themselves? Um, I think it kind of almost comes naturally now. Uh, I feel as I feel as though um, we all we. I think the root of it is is we work on the ideas we have and we work with our creativity and we work with our area. But I do think it's just a matter of then choosing, or well, not hierarchy, but working 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 out how you deal with those mediums. I mean, I suppose for example, I'm. I mean, I'm teaching and working on sound art, and I actually struggle with the idea of a thing, something called sound art, um, in the sense that it's not, it's just sound as a medium, but it's very rarely an exclusive medium. Some of our students do work exclusively in sound. No visuals work in kind of immersive sound or whatever it may be. But I think the thing is that um, anything we do is all about context and mediums contextualize that. So therefore, I think there's a danger of thinking you work specifically in one medium. You don't. It's about how your ideas are contextualized and you choose your mediums to actually do that. So I think it's a question of uh, people 
I suppose realizing that you don't you don't choose a medium exclusively, you don't choose sound exclusively, you don't choose visually sort of moving image exclusively, or you don't use say you know sort of uh, two dimensional. You actually work out the context of how that how that's going to work. So mediums do overlap, and I think particularly in a digital age where we are bombarded with media of different sorts of sound of visual now increasingly you know sort of virtual reality or different forms of reality so therefore i think there's an acceptance of the of the fluidity of mediums interacting with each other so i think it's really about whoever you are student artist just an individual working on your own you know for your own sense of fun you work on your ideas and then see which mediums then are most effective in actually realizing those things so it's about how you contextualize your ideas and using the appropriate media but i don't think there's an exclusivity i think they we work very much in multimedia naturally nowadays in the digital world Look, I agree, Stephen. I don't know about you, you know, we do this. We do, you know, whether it be media, whether it be cultural studies, whether it be communication studies, that's our bread and butter. That's what we do for a living. But were you rather sort of stunned and amazed to see these remarkable people from allied health, from, from medicine, uh, from the, the incredible diversity of our disciplines in the comprehensive university expressing themselves in such a profound way through the three minute mm. thesis? I, mean, I think we always go, you know, we do the media, we're the communication specialists. And then we see all these different disciplines doing an incredible job. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think it's just about expression now. It's about communication. And I think everybody, we all exist in this world where, you know, the ideas, the ideas are one thing. It's the, it's how we communicate those, those ideas, which is the important thing. And we now, uh, uh, in a, we're in a position to communicate in many different ways. And so therefore I think, and also I think, you know, the, the, the key to it is, is that as the, as the sort of tools of creation have become massively democratized and you know everything's online you can you can actually do all this whether it's a, from a presentation to making a you know a piece of art you can you can do that yourself online and so therefore we have the ability nowadays to communicate through those tools so whatever you're doing you can put it in that in that sort of you can frame it and communicate it in that way so i think it's opening up those tools have opened it up for people to be creative in in so many different areas not oh i'm an artist so i create whereas now we're all artists and we all create it depends how you want to do it really so we we've, we've opened those we've opened up those doors to everybody oh you're amazing and, and just my final question this little bit for you about you and about I suppose since we were last together teaching together working together um how do you think the doctorate itself has changed because obviously I had the privilege of supervising you and you were just absolutely stunning but that was a long time ago in all that you've experienced as a as a senior academic now how has the doctorate changed since you did yours well I think probably it it's difficult for me because it well, not difficult it, i suppose my 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 kind of uh, perspective on doing a doctorate was framed by probably by a more, much more traditional kind of um model or template and for me also i'd done the practice so i wanted to write the kind of theoretical kind of framework around the, the work i'd done so i chose it that way but and that seemed to be <coughs> excuse me the, mo the kind of the most common and default form of a thesis but in recent years particularly um, working in the arts much more in Brighton uh, uh, it has meant that you, I'm exposed and see so many different ways of people doing video uh, doing PhDs <laughs> video, sorry doing PhDs and that's become fascinating for me I'm I'm working at the moment uh, I'm, I'm supervising a PhD on noise Wow. Uh, but it's a pra practice based one um and it's fascinating because the premise of the thesis is that uh the two parts of the thesis of the practice piece the actual you know the the creative components of it that are presented and the written component of it should exist kind of mutually like, exclusively it's on the basis that uh, the basis of the of the candidate caleb his name's caleb madden uh, is that 
the the written component should not be an explanation of the visual component of the films and the pieces of music and performance he's done, nor should the actual performance and practice pieces just be a realization of the thesis. They should both be accepted as equal and exclusive. So I've got a unique thing. It's not even practice led or practice informed. It's just a parallel one. Uh, so that's one example of how it's changed about how the relationship between practice and um, and you know the theory part. And you were the first person to you know I remember going through um, a practice based PhD with you while I was in Brighton, and that opened up my mind to how much practice is. So I've become I suppose I'm, what I'm saying is I'm much more aware of and being uh, connected to a more practiced approach. To, to it. There's another one, um, he, he teaches on the MA down here in Brighton, Alex Pollard. I mean, he's just completing his PhD and his is actually a graphic novel. Wow. Which is an explanation of, uh, it's, it's about Philip K. Dick. So it's all Philip K. Dick's work driven into a graphic novel. Uh, that's his PhD. So therefore the idea of um, what's changed for me is the, the ability and the understanding of academics, particularly to um, accept and understand how the PhD can change form and also removing the, the, the sort of, uh, I suppose, the fact that theory it, or the written word, the text, is the only way of expressing those ideas, and that has completely changed for me. The way that a PhD can be expressed in different forms is probably the key to it, and how that's rapidly changing. So, hi, Byron. Hi, Tara. <laughs> you are amazing. You're one of the, the great scholars, the scholars that I've met in the last year, one of the great scholars that I read and you're changing my mind furniture. You are legendary on behalf of the university. Thank you so much for being involved in this judging. But before we get to the judging itself, I want to talk about you. Is that okay? That's fine. Because you are, you are spectacular and, and you do so much fascinating work about Indigenous epistemology um, but also about the work I've been quoting you recently on is about your work with digitization and Indigenous sovereignty and Indigenous knowledges. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what drew you to this area? Because you've had this explosion of incredible publications in the last 12 months that are picking up citations. So tell us about this area and what drew you to it, mate. Um, what drew me to that area was the um, rise of COVID-19. <laughs> way, yeah, and the way that it affected um, online, you know, it pushed us all into online learning um, in ways that were unprecedented. Um, in particular, I was teaching a course at that time through an Indigenous institution, and it was a, an Indigenous master's course. And, um, you know, from a Māori point of view, from an Indigenous point of view, the normal way of teaching would be kind of a, what we call it noho marae, and that means it's a five-day intensive where you stay together, you sleep together, you eat together, you study together, and you, you talk together, and that's the normal kind of Māori way of, of doing uh, learning. Yes. And COVID-19 ruined all of that. So we had to find new ways to engage students um, in kind of indigenous ways, um, but that are also digital ways. So that's what pulled me into that direction of, of thinking and, uh, and writing. Oh, look, it's incredible. And there, there wouldn't be a more powerful time to be having these types of conversations, considering what we will just talk about it for a second, what happened at the University of Auckland, uh, what a month ago with the Māori Tanga conversation you know Maori knowledges versus science I mean it sounds like sort of a science fictional war really so mm. how how do you manage as an outstanding international scholar Maori scholar and and find the space the digital and the analog space to to create new ideas to support and enable our students and occupy uh, a decolonizing university and hope for a post-colonial future. What, what do you do, Byron? Um, well, 
part of what has what I've found successful is ensuring that Mātauranga Māori or Māori knowledge is embedded in in everything, including in the digital space. So in Māori culture, for example, it's normal to begin um, classes or learning sessions with karakia, which is a type of an incantation, yes. and, and to finish with the same. So, you know, even in a digital in a digital space, you know, we ensure that we use those processes, that we embed those processes and that knowledge into digital learning. Um, and I've currently work at Unitech, which is um, a, a different um, tertiary institution. And I, you know, what we do at Unitech as well is that Mātauranga Māori needs to be embedded in the curriculum. Yes. And, you know, we have a policy called I See Me, which is about Māori and Pacific people um, being able to see themselves reflected in the curriculum and, and, and in the teaching body as the teaching staff as well. So Unitech is doing some great work in that regard and is doing its best to make sure that Māori and Pacific peoples are reflected in what they learn. Yeah. And so that's, that's how I think we're kind of really trying to lead the way in that space because a lot of the other universities are trying to do the same thing but uh, may not be succeeding in the same way. For example, with the University of Auckland um, uh, issue that came out recently, I mean, I know that those academics are, um, you know, using their academic freedom, but it was a bit irresponsible because they didn't, they don't know enough about Mātauranga Māori to critique it. So it would be fine if they knew about it, but they don't. And so they're critiquing something they don't know anything about. Yeah. So that's a problem. Mm. Look, look, it is. And you've raised that problem and you've provided profound solutions um, for the remarkable Māori Pacific Islander students that you teach, but also providing way forwards for Pākehā, finding spaces for, you know, what we call on show white fellas, you know, the colonising population that gain from colonisation every single day. Today, in the past, tomorrow, we gain from colonisation. And yet what we do with that knowledge, I mean, it can be reified to white privilege, but it's more than that. Um, you know, co colonisation is more than simply white privilege. And you provide knowledge and the learnings for us if we are prepared to do the work to, to find spaces for us to support you. Uh, support the spaces of these remarkable students that are coming forward and, and changing knowledge. And Byron, you are changing knowledge. It is a privilege to know you. And it's a privilege to know you too, Tara. Oh. I've been following you. You got me through my second PhD. You really did. I came upon your videos qu quite by accident. And I mean, they were on, I was watching them on the daily. And I constantly send them to my students like, oh, this is for PhD, but you can apply it to masters. Watch this, watch this. Well, yeah. just, just remember for the great colleagues that are meeting you for the first time and immediately going to go to Google Scholar after seeing you today, that this remarkable human has done two PhDs. So we need to remember that. And, you know, we need to monitor your career and use and cite your research, which is my priority, because it's all well and good to talk and value Māori knowledge. But one of the ways we do that is to value and enable Māori scholars and cite your incredible research. It's through the politics of citation that we create changes in knowledge, I think. Thank you so much, Tara. That's amazing. I can't breathe. I feel like I'm drowning. I am slowly suffocating. I am reduced to nothing. I've heard these words from people who were suffering from chronic breathlessness due to life-limiting illnesses. As a young doctor, I was desperate to help them, but I didn't know how. Despite receiving the best available treatments, they were still breathless, struggling to engage in basic daily activities, such as going shopping, playing with their grandchildren, or even having a shower. So what can we do to help these people? 
Well, one pill a day of slow-release morphine in very small doses seems to be helpful in some cases. But while some people report large reductions in breathlessness, allowing them to feel alive for the first time in years, others report no significant changes or even harms. My PhD looked at possible causes for these differences. So first, we collected blood samples and looked at people's genes. And we realized that specific variations in certain genes are linked to larger reductions in breathlessness in response to morphine. Then we collected saliva samples and looked at cortisol, the stress hormone. And in healthy people, cortisol levels declined throughout the day. But in people with chronic breathlessness, cortisol levels are more constant, which has been linked with worse health outcomes, including mortality. So when morphine reduces breathlessness, is it also restoring part of a healthier cortisol profile? Results from these studies are coming soon. And finally, we looked at response to morphine, depending on the cause of breathlessness and we realized that people with a certain condition affecting the blood vessels in their lungs are unlikely to respond to morphine. So now you may ask yourselves, why is my research important? Because the focus of medicine is on treating disease, but we need to start treating human beings who are at the core of palliative care. Half of us will experience breathlessness at the end of life. And when there is no cure for the underlying disease, using morphine smartly may help reduce the type of suffering depicted by the woman in this painting and also help prevent unnecessary harms. Caring for those who suffer is the essence of medicine and the very reason why I decided to become a medical doctor. Thank you. Get me out of here. I don't want to go to a nursing home. Those were the words of my late grandma, a lovely 85-year-old who thought that going to a nursing home was worse than death. It all started when she had a fall and was sent to the hospital where she stayed for weeks. When she got home, she felt weaker than before and was always exhausted. Months later, my grandma had another fall and the cycle repeats. I always wonder, could her story be different? Could it be like in this picture? Hospital stays are notoriously known to decondition everyone, especially older people. Deconditioning is like a process where you lose your fitness. And for my grandma, the hospital stays have deconditioned her to a point where she couldn't bounce back. This is a major problem for over 2 million older Australians the vicious cycle of hospital admissions one after another. And for some, even asked or strongly encouraged to move away from their nest into a nursing facility. My research aims to break this cycle. And as much as we all hate to hear these three words in the pandemic, my research aims to help older people self-care and stay at home. Together with my professors, I've developed an exercise and nutrition hospital to home support program to empower older people like my late grandma to maintain independence. At the very core of this program is the Flinders Chronic Condition Self-Management Model, a one-on-one -on -one patient provider approach. This program has also been informed by people like my late grandma. I've conducted extensive interviews with 22 of them in the hospital. While in the hospital, I visit them daily as a therapy assistant to make sure they get their daily dose of exercise and also ensure that their meals are optimized for strength. When they discharge home, I visit them four times over three months to deliver that care beyond hospitalization. I also call them in between visits to check in on their progress. I have completed 75% of the project and the results are looking really promising. Almost all my participants have said that they feel stronger, better, faster. My sassy 93-year-old participant even told me that she has been looking at the mirror a little more these days. 
I even have inquiries from their GPs to ask me about these positive changes. Like in the picture, my research can help older people like my late grandma get their jazz back and stay at home because home is where the heart is. When I was 16, I remember being chased by two players in touch football. More specifically, I remember when they took my legs out from underneath me. I'll never forget the impact of hitting the ground screaming as I clutched my knee. Tearing my ACL was traumatic, but it had far-reaching implications. Unable to play or train, I was suddenly alone. I went from insider to outsider, and in many ways, I was no longer a part of the team. Unfortunately, this is an all too common story. While on the one hand, we celebrate the growth of sporting opportunities for young female Australians, on the other, we haven't given attention to the associated rise in significant injury. And so there are potentially thousands of girls across the nation who are currently suffering in silence. Research shows that girls experience increased psychological distress following injury and feel socially isolated during rehabilitation. Enhancing social support is the single most important tool in combating psychological distress, improving player well-being and optimizing rehabilitation practices. Despite this, the reality often is that when young females get injured, the subsequent social support provision is often left to chance. I think we can all agree that social support is important, especially in this context. However, Little is known about how we can improve social support in sporting environments for those who are often forgotten following injury. My research aims to explore current social support experiences of female athletes who have sustained significant injury and generate knowledge about sporting club policies designed explicitly to promote social support. I am undertaking intensive field work in elite, state league and local Australian women's football environments. And I'm interviewing coaches, players and medical staff to develop a theoretically informed understanding. Preliminary findings suggest that communication breakdowns can leave players unaware of what support's available to them, leaving them to suffer in silence. It's also suggested that clubs may benefit from having a staff member who's the go-to person when players, injured or not, need help, or even just someone to listen to them. My research will help enhance coach education, improve player well-being and support female athletes return to competition. It grows our government's strategic vision of an active state, connected communities and inspired performance and thus is socially, culturally and politically vital. But more importantly to me, my research will help the many athletes who sustain injury and become lost to the physical aspects of society and culture. I lost contact with a large social group as a result of my injury. And I hope my research means no one else will have to do the same. What do you think of when I say the words family meal? Do you think of parents scrambling to think of what to prepare for the week, tossing up between different family members' likes and dislikes, thinking about how healthy or expensive the meal is going to be, or when they're going to find the time to get to the shops, let alone cook the meal? Or do you think of something like this picture here? Families sitting around a table, sharing a home-cooked meal, talking and laughing with one another. I'm going to bet that it was the latter. And this is the case in family meal research as well. With most studies focused on what happens at the meal, there's very little investigation into the work required to achieve it. With high rates of poor eating habits and almost one in four Australian children experiencing overweight or obesity, we are always looking for opportunities to encourage health-promoting behaviours. Well, the family meal has been proposed as one such opportunity, with studies linking regular family meals to a range of health outcomes. For this very reason, the family meal is promoted as a healthful activity for families. Makes sense, right? But without an understanding of the work required to get the family meal on the table, this promotion of the family meal may be creating unrealistic expectations for already overburdened parents. On top of this, the family meal has been promoted in the same way for over three decades, despite the huge changes we've seen to family life over this time. To promote a realistic family meal and help support parents in achieving it so we can improve the health of our children, we need to know how parents produce it each day and how this has changed over time. And this is where I step up to the plate. 
My PhD aimed to gain an understanding of all the work involved in producing the family meal each day and how this has changed over the last 30 years. I did this by taking interview data collected with parents in the 1990s and conducting interviews with parents last year on their experiences of the family meal and all of the work involved. I analysed these interviews to create a framework, unpacking all of the work involved in family meals from start to finish. I then compared this framework over time to see what had changed and what had stayed the same. Through this work, I was able to finally shine a light on the mental and physical tasks involved in the family meal. I was able to explore how beliefs and expectations continue to impact the family meal, how parents are still looking for easy, convenient meals that their children will actually eat, that work, school and sports schedules are increasingly interfering with the family meal, and that while fathers are getting more involved, mothers are still doing most of this work. So what does this all mean? Well, now that we have an understanding of the family meal, the work involved, and how it has changed over time, we can take a step forward in supporting parents and promoting an achievable family meal for today and tomorrow. At the very least, this work will help you think of more than just this picture when I say the words family meal. Do you keep secrets under your bed? I mean, do you have a place where you keep treasured objects? Whether it's a box under your bed or in your attic or garage. I do, and it's this box here. I first created this box when I was 18 and my life had been turned upside down. I lost my beloved mum to terminal breast cancer and unexpectedly lost my best childhood friend. In the aftermath of these losses, I found myself without a home and I had to pack all of my belongings into just one car load. I grabbed copies of my mum's poetry, a postcard from my best friend and other treasured items and I put them in this box. And then I put that box away and I didn't look at it for another four years. Not until I started a PhD in creative writing where I spent my days at my desk writing a book about these losses. These books are called Grief Memoir and I also research why and how people write them in the first place. Have you ever experienced loss? If you have, you might know something that I realised really quickly in my research. And that is the fact that grief is messy. Grief is scattering. It changes how we view ourselves, how we view the world. Things like truth, time, memory get all tangled up. And for something like memoir, which actually comes from the French word for memory, this can be a real problem. In my research, I ask, how can writers accurately represent their grief if they find their memories hard to access? It was then that I remembered the box under my bed. I had a hunch that by pulling it out and rifling through it, taking notes as I went, I might be able to fill some of those gaps in my memory. In life narrative studies, this is called self-research because I was quite literally researching my own life. And I had an epiphany while undertaking this self-research. I realised that, yes, it was filling gaps in my memory, but it was also telling me important things about the people I had lost, about our relationships, and really importantly, about my own identity. I realised that myself and writers like me could include photos and scans of these types of objects in our grief writing in order to begin untangling some of the messiness. We need this research now more than ever as we experience loss on a global scale. We need to be able to tell coherent and impactful stories of loss. And memory boxes are one such tool to be able to do so. Thank you. It's midnight and the baby is crying. The three and four year old have fallen asleep in the back seat of the car. I take a deep breath as I knock on the door. Their aunt has only agreed to care for them for the one night, but I'm hoping I can talk her into a full week. That'll give me enough time to get the results back from the drug tests of the children's parents. If not, I'll be back tomorrow to take them somewhere else. My story is not unique. In Australia last year, over 174,000 children received some form of protective services. 
And while we make a valuable contribution to the lives of these children, we could always be better. There have been dozens of inquiries leading to hundreds of recommendations on how to improve our systems, but change has been incredibly slow. My research takes a different approach. Rather than studying the systems alone, I studied the people within those systems. I sent out a national survey to a broad range of child protection professionals. I learned that they are passionate and dedicated about the work that they do and spend a lot of time improving their own skills. I also learned that they don't always feel the systems they work in value their skills and after a few years in child protection, question whether it's the career for them. I wanted to learn more about this and so I conducted interviews. I found out that our systems have gradually been replacing the knowledge and expertise of professionals with tools, policies and frameworks. And while these are valuable parts of our system, they simply cannot replace the skills of the people who work with children every day. And no professional should ever have to decide between completing paperwork and listening to a child. The professionals I spoke to identified four things that really make a difference in child protection. Firstly, listening to children and their families, understanding their lives and being willing to have the difficult conversations. Secondly, sharing decision-making, bringing everyone together to talk through the best options available. Thirdly, being open and curious, not rushing to judgment and be willing to take on new information. And finally, being flexible and adaptive, tailoring the work that you do to suit the unique needs of each child and family. We can all agree that our system needs to be better at protecting children. But we mustn't forget it's not the system that protects children, it's the people within that system. Using my research, we can create systems that are flexible and adaptive, that help professionals use their skills to hold children in a place of safety. And by protecting children today, we can create change for generations to come. It is sometimes said that we are only six paydays away from experiencing homelessness. So this person could be me or you. And homelessness represents one of the most extreme forms of social disadvantage that we see. Despite their resilience, homeless people are often excluded, judged and discriminated against. And there are devastating health consequences that comes from living homeless. It is a significant public health concern, but it's not the only one. We are also seeing increasing rates of dementia, affecting a person's memory, thinking skills, behaviour and ability to manage everyday activities. Dementia is progressive and sadly, there is no cure. My research brings together the two public health concerns of homelessness and dementia. It explores how a person can be unfairly disadvantaged in their dementia risk because they live homeless. I examine this through interviewing people experiencing homelessness so that I can understand their lived experience and how this can impact on their brain health. I also survey homeless services in South Australia so that I understand their level of dementia knowledge. And this is interesting because early findings shows me that there are inconsistent levels of dementia knowledge understanding amongst people who work in homeless services. Why is this important? Well, if you were this person, then a homeless service may be the only support that you are able to access. And you are more likely to have a head injury and mental health condition, live with high rates of stress and psychological trauma. You find it hard to self-manage conditions such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And the harsh living conditions of homelessness will prematurely age you, meaning you have a health profile that is up to 20 years more than your chronological age. And homelessness can make you more vulnerable to alcohol dependency, heavy smoking and risk taking behaviours such as substance use. And all of these things will influence your brain health and your dementia risk. My research will provide the information and understanding around ways in which we can better support people who are experiencing homelessness reduce their dementia risk profile. Its impact will be on dementia risk reduction resources and strategies to make sure
that we have some that are meaningful and purposeful for people experiencing homelessness. This way, we can better address cognitive well-being, brain health and dementia risk reduction that works for people who are already doing it tough. I want you to imagine that you're holding a plastic bag full of water. There are holes in this bag and the water is leaking out. But you have one band-aid, so you place it over one hole and now you've stopped that leak. However, there are still other holes in the bag and the water is rapidly flowing out. And you know that the only way to stop it completely is by covering every hole. Now I want you to imagine that that plastic bag full of water is a tumour and each hole is a different way in which cancer cells can grow and survive. And that one band-aid that you used is a standard cancer therapy. Currently, this is what we are doing in medicine, only covering one, maybe two holes, leaving the others open and giving cancer a chance of survival. In order for us to cure cancer, we need to cover every hole possible, and we can only do that by understanding every way in which cancers grow. Tumors grow in nutrient poor conditions, and they need to be really sneaky in order to survive. And one thing that they do is they trick the cells around them into helping them out by sending what we call exosomes. Exosomes are small packages released by every cell in our body and they carry messages from one cell to another. Under healthy conditions, this is a great way for our cells to communicate. But in cancer, tumors manipulate the system to send bad messages to healthy cells. These bad messages can force healthy cells to become cancerous feed the tumour, or even help it evade the immune system. As you can imagine, this is a huge problem. And even though we know exosomes are helping cancer, the bigger problem is that no one understands what is controlling the release of exosomes from cells. This is the aim of my PhD project, to try and identify what protein inside the cell is controlling exosome release. And I have an idea as to which protein it might be. And one of the ways that I've tested my theory is by blocking this protein in cancer cells and simply counting the number of exosomes that are released. And what I found is that when I block this protein, there is a huge increase in exosome number, indicating that this protein is highly likely to be regulating exosome release. Additionally, I'm also on my way to showing that we can alter the messages inside the exosomes by also targeting this protein, giving us the ability to turn exosomes carrying bad messages into exosomes carrying good messages that can kill the tumour instead of helping it. But why is this so important? Well, if we can understand what is controlling exosomes in the cell, we can target it and either block exosome release or alter the messages carried inside, ultimately starving the tumour, stopping it from spreading to other organs and giving patients a better chance of survival. Every advancement that we make in cancer research Every new target that we identify is a new band-aid that we can make to cover another hole in that plastic bag full of water, taking us one step closer to the ultimate goal, curing cancer. So Uma, you've seen the videos, all the wonderful people seeing this film, this Three Minute Thesis 2021 film, have seen the finalists and they were remarkable. And can I say, you were the first judge uh, to return your judging sheet. So that suggests you were in there and very active very early. So could you give us some, some feedback? How are you feeling about 3MT? It's not big in Canada. I hope it will be. What's, what's your vibe, Uma? Oh, you know, it was... Um, yeah, I was first to submit because it was a lovely experience. It was, how can I say, it was gloriously difficult to judge because they were actually all brilliant. Um, what impressed me was they were from all different fields, um, all different methodologies. Um, and one of the things that, um, really, um, how can I say, stood out to me visually and orally was that the idea of these brilliant people to actually engage the audience. Um, I know that they are smart, but the thing is, it's back to my earlier talk, it's about reaching out to community, right? It's not to impress people with these large academic words. But there are moments in time where, you know, the everyday person or person who are not expert in the fields 
want to listen to what you do and what you want to do to change the world. So I will say my top pick was the one who uses metaphors. And I think for me, um, and I think this goes with a lot of Indigenous scholars, are the use of metaphors or or comparisons. Mm. Difficult topics, um, like putting a Band-Aid over, right? That, 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 um, that presentation made me go, okay, I'm starting to get it. And then easing in with certain terminology. But for me, when I listen, it's, I'm biased towards the methods. And if you can engage me in the methods and make it accessible to me, then I will be engaged um, with that. And I will just say that the slide was very simple. And, and the beautiful thing about simple slides are that I don't always have to look at the slide. I could always switch over to the, the speaker when it, the, the points become a little bit more important about definitions, about the purpose and the intended outcomes out of that. Um, and this actually leads me to that, to that one of my uh, other presenters where there was that very provocative um, painting beside her. And for me, that was a very good presentation because it matched what was being said. So I'm looking at the picture, I'm listening to the methodology and I'm going, wow, you have just grabbed me emotionally into your research journey. And and so, um, and this leads to the other great presenters. They were for me, very difficult because all of them had a personal interest to that. They didn't just pick a thesis because, oh my gosh, I'm in graduate school and here's my supervisor. But all of them had meaning. I remember um, one researcher who got injured in sports, right? And was isolated. And that picture is still in my head. Um, And then there's that young gentleman who's working with older people and trying to figure out ways of healing. And then there's that author, you know, with the memory box. I know. Uh, These are all difficult, but beautiful presentations. And I will say this, all of them chose that one slide beautifully. And I think this is where I will give kudos to my Australian research cousins out there, you know, Picking one slide in three minutes is difficult. And all of them um, made it effective. Um, I will, there's, how can I say? There was one gentleman who popped the slide in and out. So he would talk and then it would disappear. That actually, I I like that style too. And um, so you can focus on just listening and um, trying to make sense of it. The other thing I liked about all of the the presentations were there was a structure to it. Um, They knew what they were talking about. So, um, you know, there are days like me when I teach and I'm looking at my notes. You know, I know it's three minutes, but you you better darn know what you're talking about, (laughs) right? (laughs) And and just hit those points. And and for me, all of them, I could... I can follow the flow. So um, this is where, um, I don't know. There's, there are sayings and some people I met in indigenous circles who will do the storytelling. But sometimes storytelling without structure, without purpose, makes you want, you have to search harder for the meaning. But I think with this way, um, and I would probably, I would love to try this with actually a lot of my Indigenous students where it actually helps them focus, right? And we can give them the structures, you know, the beginning, meaning, and why do you do it? What's your method? What do you want to do with communities? And I think with all of them, you've given us great um, examples of actually how to focus the mind and um, make really big impacts because often, you know, we're not going to have an audience for 20 or 50 minutes, but you know, you're just talking to supervisors or colleague, and they're just, you know, walking up the stairs with you. So what are you doing? And you just go, dun 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 right? And so, <laughs> um, yeah. 
Oh, look, Uma, amazing. And look, I hope what we've done well at Flinders, and we have focused a lot of attention on it, is the notion of dissemination and dissemination with integrity. So mm -hmm. disseminating through multiple audiences. And I hope we've put a, a lot of attention on, as you've said, the researcher's story and how that enfolds or dovetails into the story of research. And I think mm -hmm. the three minute thesis, I've never seen eight outstanding presentations such as this. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what I want to say to you, Umar, is you've taught me so much. You and I had the privilege of working together um, mm -hmm. over multiple nations, can I say, and multiple courses. And you taught me so much about the importance of the story and how the story travels with integrity. Mm -hmm. And those lessons that I learned from you, I continue in every minute of my working and my personal life. And I just want to thank you for your friendship. Thank you for judging this remarkable competition. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I think we've got a bunch of people now who want to hear just about everything you want to say. So I might actually have to book you for a, for a vlog at this point. But Umar, during this busy time of year, thanks so much for sparing the time for Flinders University. Happy to do it. it was an incredible experience. Steve, what do you think is the great benefit for the great students that you've seen today? What are the great benefits of doing a, a three-minute thesis presentation like this? Um, <laughs> actually, it's what you taught me. You taught me this. You, uh, you told me, and I tell it to my, it, it, no matter what group of students it is from first years down to PhDs, but it's very relevant with PhDs, and that is, what is your idea? You have to obviously sum it up in a one sentence strap line and you have to be ex able to explain it to your granny. And, that, and that's what a three minute thing is. The yeah. point is no matter how complex your ideas are, the important thing is to be able to communicate those ideas in a very, very distilled form. So you can just cut to, cut to the nub of the issue. And that's why I think it's really important with, with the idea of the three minute thesis is it's opening it up. Ideas are great, but if you can't communicate them, that's the that's the you know that's the, the most difficult thing. And as always, you know, um, uh, you know the <laughs> the great Professor Lang, Stuart Lang, always said to me, "Smart people, smart people make complex ideas simple. Stupid people make simple ideas complex." And that is it, really, in a nub. So I'm actually not coming up with anything original myself. I'm actually paraphrasing you and uh, Stuart Lang, who used to well, be... Well, can, can I say probably both of us, or all of us, have ripped off a bit of Antonio Gramsci there. Um, yeah, the, the nature of... <laughs> Which uh, we got good company, but, you know, and that, that's what happens when you're imprisoned by the Benito Mussolini regime, uh, is that you do <laughs> organic intellectual and the importance of knowing your field so well that you're able to communicate it to a diversity of audiences. And that's why you are such a, a precious judge for us, Steve. And I thank you for the friendship we've had over, over decades now. And I cannot tell you the light and the happiness that it gives me to see that your career, you've moved through so many different careers and so many different successes. And to see how you continue to change lives through all these different things, it is an inspiration for students all over the world. And I'm so glad that the students at Brighton have you, have your example. And I'm so glad I was able to pinch a little bit of this for a tiny little bit of Australia uh, in Adelaide, next stop Antarctica. Mate, thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Well done to the students. Uh, um, you know, amazing work. So congratulations to whoever wins. Uh, and But for all the others, well done for competing and being involved to take it on. Well, first of all, congratulations to all of you. I just want to say you were absolutely brilliant. And your research projects are so worthwhile. I was in awe of the quality of the presentations. They're absolutely phenomenal. The clarity with which you talked about the project aims, the methodologies and the outcomes, they were all beautifully communicated so clearly and succinct. The original contributions to research, wow, absolutely tremendous. I know they will benefit not just the disciplines that you represent, but also society in general. Thank you for this. 
I also want to congratulate you on the dedication and the passion you showed. Without this, it's often difficult to continue with the long-term research projects, such as a doctoral research one. Finally, I just wanted to say thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this research celebration because that is what it was. It's been enjoyable and humbling to meet you all, albeit online. I wish you the very best. Now, Byron, we've had the privilege at Flinders University and one of the gifts in some ways of the pandemic, who knew that was a thing? One of the gifts of the pandemic is we made a decision to have international judges and we've got judges from three different nations, four judges from three nations, remarkable human beings. And you were my first pick of the remarkable human being to be a judge for us for three minute thesis for Flinders this year. Now, could I, on behalf of our students in the university, get your feedback on, you've seen the eight videos, you've ranked them, you have judged them, and we're aggregating the results now. What's your feedback for our students, but for our institutions too, about how we're going uh, in, in disseminating research? Thanks for that, Tara. Um... The first of all, I'd like to say that the um, the presentations were of a, an exceptionally high standard. Um, they were so high, in fact, that it made the judging of them very, very difficult. And the only way to kind of get through judging those presentations was to be ultra nitpicky about tiny things because they were that good. So that was the only way to kind of distinguish quality between them but they were all exceptionally good high quality presentations and of course um you know the pandemic um having to record them because i'm assuming they would normally be presented out yeah um that you know these these challenges um are difficult but they also create these pockets of creativity where people have to find new ways of of doing things and disseminating research and, and having these types of competitions um, in, a, in a pandemic type situation. So what was great about it is that you were able to have international um, scholars come on and, and judge, and we didn't have to fly anywhere. We could just do it from our home. So it was, it was fabulous. And this is, this is what's great about digital technologies. We're able to do these types of things from a distance. Um, so yes, the quality of the presentations was very, very high. Um, and I, I, I did find a couple of favorites um, and it did take time to find those. I've watched the videos three times now and slowed them down and then stopped and started. Um, but I was just so impressed, so impressed and inspired. And I've shared the, uh, the presentation link with my the Facebook people that follow me, but also um, with my postgrad students, and they've had they've got their own opinions. And um, interestingly enough, their opinions have aligned a lot with mine. Isn't so that nice. tells me that yeah, that tells me that it, you know I must have been on the right track. You are always on the right track. And Byron, can I say to you, let's hope in a year's time because you're currently in a, in a lockdown situation mm. thankfully in Adelaide we're not at the moment but you know we're one case away from being a lockdown at the moment with the Delta strain and Byron let me just say to you on behalf of the university thank you for the incredible work you've done for us but can I also say I hope in a year's time that I can buy you where are we at 57 muffins some some hot chocolate like long blacks crazy stuff and I'll come and meet your remarkable students and and we'll do a swap of expertise which was sort of the reason most of us got into higher education in the first place mate yes please that would be great and it, on on the topic of coffee um you may not know this but there are four levels that we use in New Zealand for a lockdown level four is extraordinarily strict you cannot even buy coffee oh. No wow. one has coffee. No one's allowed to sell coffee or sell hot food. Wow. Um, and what's, what's your coffee of choice, Byron, just so I know for future for future needs? It's the good old flat white. You're, you're a flat white. I'm a long yeah. black. This is a match made in heaven, Byron. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara.
Byron, thank you for your time, mate. And uh, you've, you've changed what we do at Flinders University. Thank you for your time and thank you for your expertise. Thank you, Tara, and you have a great day. Isn't this exciting? Wasn't it wonderful to meet these incredible judges? I've learned so much. I'm so inspired by these people, but I have one final job. And you know what that job is? That job is to announce the winners. Are you excited? I'm so excited. Now, did you have your favorites? Were you scoring on the way through? So you have a notion about who's won? Because remember, we're about to announce three awards, the runner up, the winner, and the people's choice award because democracy matters. Just got to keep reminding people of that in 2021. Now, when I talk about democracy mattering, it's sort of like me in the pinata of the zombie apocalypse. So there's not much happening here, but I'm terribly excited. So we're going to announce these awards. My beautiful assistant is Hector, Hector the Skull. He doesn't say a lot, uh, but he's as excited as I am. And trust me, he's got a lot to be excited about. So let's make the announcement. And what I need to tell you at the start as I'm making this announcement is that unbelievably, unbelievably only two points separated the top four of the finalists two points and eight points separated the entire field i mean absolutely amazing shows you how close this was so without stretching this out any further let's announce some fabulous things so firstly the people's choice winner chad han we're on your Chad. Remember, Chad's was stay at home, breaking that cycle of hospital readmission. Fantastic. So Chad, as the People's Choice winner, wins $500. Let's move to the runner-up. Let's see if you were right. Who's the runner-up? Let's do it. The runner-up is Riam Monza. Riam, fantastic. And of course, that was that great presentation on curing cancer, one band-aid at a time. Great title, that one, great presentation. And Riam wins $1,000. Boom. You ready for the big one? The winner of the 2021 Flinders University three-minute thesis final is... Chad Han. <laughs> Stay at home, breaking the vicious cycle of hospital readmission. So yes, the legendary Chad won the people's choice and won the best overall presentation. So it shows you democracy and quality can align. I know 2021 suggests different messages, but Chad confirms that democracy and quality can proliferate. Colleagues, thank you so much for sharing this time with me. It is an incredible privilege to see the future of scholarship. And thank you for sharing this time and this journey with me. It is inspirational to know that knowledge, high quality knowledge moves and high quality knowledge transforms. So thank you for being a part of this transformational journey. Be well. <laughs>